Hello. So we're going to uh, take a look at Odysseus's Revenge, which takes place right after the challenge. So Odysseus has just um, won the battle, essentially, or won the game that Penelope has put up the challenge for him um, and shot the arrow. And he's revealed himself to be Odysseus. So if you take a look at the end here, he says, he dropped his eyes and nodded, and the prince Telemachus, true son of King Odysseus, hefted his sword on, clapped his hand to his spear, and with a clink and glitter of keen bronze, stood by his chair in the forefront near his father. So now, suddenly, we've got Odysseus and Telemachus here and ready to go. So let's take a look at Odysseus's revenge. Now, shrugging off his rags, the wiliest fighter of the islands leapt and stood on the broad door sill, his own bow in his hand. He poured out at his feet a rain of arrows from the quiver and spoke to the crowd. So much for that. Your clean-cut game is over. Now watch me hit a target that no man has hit before. If I can make this shot, help me, Apollo. He drew his fist, the cruel head of an arrow for Antinous, just as the young man lifted it to leaned to lift his beautiful drinking cup, embossed, two-handled and golden. The cup was in his fingers, the wine was even at his lips. And did he dream of death? How could he in that revelry among his throng of friends, who would imagine a single foe, though a strong foe indeed, could dare to bring death, death's pain on him and darkness on his eyes? Odysseus's arrow hit him under the chin and punched up to the feathers through his throat. Backward and down he went, letting the wine cup fall from his shocked hand. Like pipes, his nostrils jutted crimson runnels, a river of mortal red, and one last kick upset his table, knocking the bread and meat to soak in dusty blood. Now, if that's not imagery, visual imagery, I don't know what is. You can totally picture that. Plus, it includes, like pipes, his nostrils jutted crimson runnels, so we've got a simile in there, and we've got a metaphor, a river of mortal red, comparing his blood flowing to a river. And we've got all sorts of visual imagery. I like how uh, Homer describes his blood as dusty blood, which is really an interesting choice. You don't think of blood as being dusty, but when you combine it with bread and meat, you probably get a little dust in there. Continuing. Now as they craned to see their champion where he lay, the suitors jostled in uproar down the hall, everyone on his feet. Wildly, they turned and scanned the walls in the long room for arms, but not a shield, not a good ashen spear was there for a man to take and throw. All they could do was yell in outrage at Odysseus. Foul to shoot at a man. That was your last shot. Your own throat will be slit for this. Our finest lad is down. You killed the best on Ithaca. Buzzards will tear your eyes out for they imagined as they wished that it was a wild shot, an unintended killing. Fools, not to comp comprehend that they were already in the grip of death. But glaring under his brows, Odysseus answered, you yellow dogs, metaphor, yellow dogs, calling the suitors. You thought I'd never make it home from the land of Troy. You took my house to plunder. You dared bid for my wife while I was still alive. Contempt was all you had for the gods who rule wide heaven. Contempt for what men say of you hereafter. Your last hour has come. You die in blood. As they all took this in, sickly green fear pulled at their entrails, and their eyes flickered, looking for some hatch or hide away from death. Sickly green fear pulled at their entrails. Remember what that is? Personification. Eurymachus alone could speak. He said, if you are Odysseus of Ithaca, come back. All that you say these men have done is true. Rash actions many here, more in the countryside. But here he lies, the man who caused them all. Antinous was the ringleader. He whipped us on to do these things. He cared less for a marriage than for the power Cronian has denied him as king of Ithaca. For that, he tried to trap your son and would have killed him. He is dead now and has his portion. Spare your own people. As for ourselves, we'll make restitution of wine and meat consumed and add each one a tithe of 20 oxen with gifts of bronze and gold to warm your heart. Meanwhile, we cannot blame you for your anger. So let's look at what Antinous says here, or Eurymachus says here. So Eurymachus says here that um, basically don't blame us. Antinous was the ringleader. He did everything 
And we are not blameless, but we are, you know, he, the ringleader is dead and has his portion. So he promises that they will, each man will give a tithe of 20 oxen with gifts of bronze and gold to warm Odysseus's heart. So he basically says, we'll give you lots of stuff if you leave us alone. Odysseus glowered under his black brows and said, not for the whole treasure of your fathers, all you enjoy, lands, flocks, or any gold put up by others would I hold my hand. There will be killing till the score is paid. You force yourselves upon this house. Fight your way out or run for it if you think you'll escape death. I doubt one man of you skins by. They felt their knees fail and their hearts, but heard Eurymachus for the last time rallying. Friends, he said, this man is implacable. That means he is immovable. You cannot change his mind. Now that he's got his hands on bow and quiver, he'll shoot from the big doorstone there until he kills us to the last man. Fight, I say. Let's remember the joy of it. Swords out. Hold up your tables to deflect his arrows. After me, everyone. Rush him where he stands. If we can budge him from the door. If we can pass into town, we'll call out men to chase him. This fellow with his bow will shoot no more. He drew his own sword as he spoke. A broadsword of fine bronze, honed like a razor on either edge. Then crying hoarse and loud, he hurled himself at Odysseus. But the kingly man let fly an arrow that instant, and the quivering feathered butt sprang to the nipple of his breast as the barb struck, stuck in his liver. The broad, bright broadsword clanged down, and he lurched and fell aside, pitching across his table. His cup, his bread and meat were split and scattered far and wide, wide and his head slammed on the ground. Revulsion, anguish in his heart, with both feet kicking out, he downed his chair while the shrouding wave of mist closed on his eyes. Another really good portion of imagery. And Homer does that specifically because he knows that his readers or his listeners are looking for that and they want to see Odysseus take his revenge on these suitors. Amphimenus now came running at Odysseus, broadsword naked in his hand. He thought to make the Greek soldier give way at the door. But with a spear throw from behind, Telemachus hit him between the shoulders, and the lance head drove clear through his chest. He left his feet and fell forward, thudding forehead against the ground. Telemachus swerved around him, leaving the long, dark spear planted in Amphimenus. If he paused to yank it out, someone might jump him from behind or cut him down with a sword at the moment he bent over. So he ran, ran from the tables to his father's side and halted, panting, saying, Father, let me bring you a shield and spear, a pair of spears, a helmet. I can run on, I can arm on the run myself. I'll give outfits to Eumaeus and this cowherd. Better to have equipment, said Odysseus. Run then, while I hold them off with arrows as long as the arrows last. While all are gone, if I'm alone, they can dislodge me. Quick upon his father's word, Telemachus ran to the room where the spears and armor lay. He caught up four light shields, four pairs of spears, four helms of war, high plumed with flowing manes, and ran back, loaded down to his father's side. He was the first to pull a helmet on and slide his bare arm in a buckler strap. The servants armed themselves, and all three took their stand beside the master of battle. While he had arrows, he aimed and shot, and every shot brought down one of his huddling enemies. But when all barbs had flown from the bowman's fist, he leaned his bow in the bright entryway beside the door and armed a four-ply shield hard on his shoulder and a crested helm, horsetail knotted stormy upon his head, and then took his tough and bronze-shod spears. Okay, now, the real, um, like the full-length odyssey goes into like the deaths of almost all the suitors. It goes on and on. So the book here has summarized for you. Aided by Athena, Odysseus, Telemachus, Eumaeus, and other faithful herdsmen kill all the suitors. So it's not just Odysseus and Telemachus. Athena is there, and Eumaeus, that's the you know goat herd, basically, and then other shepherds and things like that that are friends of Eumaeus are there all killing the suitors. And Odysseus looked around him, narrow-eyed for any others who had lain hidden while death's black fury passed. Personification, right? In blood and dust, he saw that crowd all fallen, many and many slain. Okay, now we've got a really good example of Homeric metaphor. Think of a catch that fishermen haul into a half moon bay in a fine mesh net from the white caps of the sea. How all are poured out on the sand in throws for the salt air, twitching their cold lives away in Helios's fiery air. 
So lay the suitors heaped on one another. And that's the end of that story. So I got a lot of good language things going on here, a lot of imagery, personification, simile, metaphor. Um, also, you want to think about what theme do we see from that collection of themes happening here in this story. Um, we will talk more about the ending of the Odyssey in class tomorrow.